Okay, good evening, everyone. Nobody is there. Good evening, sir. Yes. Okay, there are six people. Uh, Proposal, you haven't accepted the invitation. Uh, the what is the link in, uh, or the invitation for the Google Classroom? Why is that? You have been added, but you haven't accepted it. No, I didn't receive an invitation. Sorry. Sir, I didn't receive an invitation. Uh, you should have been in your uh, science feed in email. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, I couldn't check that. Sir. I will check that, sir. Yeah, yeah. You have to go into the classroom, otherwise uh, you can't get any message. Okay, sir. <clears throat> you have been given the uh, science feed in email recently, uh, right? Yes. So you, yeah. So you have to check it frequently. Okay, sir. I'll check. Okay, so we, uh, do you remember where we have stopped? Yes, you, you have to re remind me. Some of you have to initiate. Where did you stop? So we were we we, we uh, discuss about the mental. Uh, mental things. So where did we stop? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I am you models. Sorry. Uh, H I M U models. Yeah. Hi, me. Yeah, we, we stopped there at the lead dye stop composition, right? We find we, we lastly did the lead dye stop composition of the mantle reservoirs, right? So high mu and uh, uh, the, the features of uh, the mantle reservoirs in terms of lead dye stop. So do you remember uh, NHRL Northern Hemisphere Reference Line? Northern Hemisphere re reference line, remember? What about Dupal anomaly? We we discussed about that already. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, so uh, the lead dye stops are very particular uh, in uh, in the mantle, and also it's uh, uh, not easy to uh, analyze. Also, I think we did some. Uh, demonst or oh, some aspects related to analysis as well, right? The experimental uh, protocols, column preparation or the column chemistry and all. Is it? Do you remember? Iron chrom chromatography? Didn't you do it? I think I did it. So how many of you can remember? Just raise hands. Nobody? How many of you can remember? No one can remember? Are you sure? Quickly tell me whether you can remember it or no. Otherwise, I can do it uh, once more, Some, uh, but not today. In an extra lecture, I can do it if you want to do it again about the experimental protocols related with uh, the isotope analysis. I think I briefly did it. You have to respond, otherwise how, how do you know? Sir, 
and chromatography has done briefly. Yeah, we did briefly. So, okay. Uh, do you remember what we discussed under that? What is ion chromatography? What is the instrument uh, we use to analyze isotopes? What can be the instruments? There can be several. So what about Pramod? Name one instrument. Pramod, are you there? Mm, yes, sir. I am there. Yeah. So, uh, what is the what? what uh, tell me what uh, one instrument you can use for isotopic analysis. So, what about Shehani? Mass spectrometer, sir. Which spectrometer? Uh, mass spectrometer. Yes, mass spectrometer is a common term, general term. Uh, there are several types of uh, spectrometers. IRM is sir. IRM. Isotope hmm? ratio mass spectrometer. Isotope ratio mass spectrometer. Hmm. Is it different from the other mass spectrometers? How, how does it differ from other mass spectrometers then? Because I didn't mention about that. I haven't mentioned any instrument called isotope ratio mass spectrometer. So what about uh, next, who is it? Ishara? Yes, quickly. You have to answer. Okay, Indralal. ICPMS. Yes, ICPMS. Okay. So, what is ICPMS then? What, what, what does it stand for? Inductively coupled plasma spectrometry. Yes, correct. Uh, another instrument, uh, Hasini? TIMS. Yeah, what is TIMS? What do you mean by uh, what does it stand for? Uh, TIMS means TIMS. We call it TIMS. Yes. Thermal ionization mass spectrometer. Yeah, thermal ionization mass spectrometer. Spectrometer. Uh, I think I mentioned one more. Satma. Yes. Can you name another? I think I mentioned one, one, one more instrument. So what about Proboda? Sir, no. For isotopic uh, isotope ratio measurements, you can't use that, as far as I know. I think I mentioned one more instrument, something like TIMS, but it's not TIMS. Something else. One letter is different. No one can remember? I think I mentioned about SIMS, did I? SIMS? Yeah. 
es IMS, no? Okay, what about shrimp then? Did I mention about shrimp? S H R I M P. No. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> okay. Anyway, SIMS is another instrument. Uh, SIMS means secondary ion mass spectrometer. Okay. Uh, it can be used uh, to analyze uh, trace elements, uh, react elements also. But for isotope measurements, also you can use uh, SIMS. And there is another one called shrimp. Shrimp, you know, shrimp, S H R I M P, shrimp. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, also like a sims uh, but uh, a more advanced version okay uh, shrimp means as uh, uh, sensitive high resolution uh, sensitive high resolution ion mass spectrometer okay it's different you can use uh, uh, for in situ measurements as well so what do you mean by in situ measurements has anyone heard about uh, in situ measurements in situ or in situ measurements? Okay, it's it's actually uh, without processing the, uh, I mean, uh, without uh, uh, proce yeah, processing the sample mainly. For example, uh, ICBM is if you want to analyze the sample, you have to dissolve it. I mean, you have to crush it, crush the rock and make it a powder. And then using various acids, you have to uh, dissolve, digest, and then evaporate, filter, and uh, after that you have to put it into the uh, resins and, and chromatography, right? Uh, but uh, even for teams, same thing, right? Same way, uh, you have to prepare the sample first of all. Later on, you uh, follow some different ways uh, from SIMS and ICPMS, uh, from teams and ICPMS. But for SIMS, you can use the inside to sample also, in situ sample, even uh, the sample itself. You can use as it is, right? But usually, what we do is we make uh, a thin section, drop thin section, and that thin section you can use directly because thin section is also the uh, rock. Although we cut the rock, but we don't destroy the sample, right? We cut it and only uh, polish it, right, uh, to a thickness of 0 0.03 millimeter. And then uh, further, you have to polish that sample uh, uh, with. Uh, with uh, some diamond uh, paste and you have to make it uh, very shiny uh, so that uh, uh, the you make it a very very uh, smooth surface right and then uh, you can directly use that sample uh, for analysis uh, under the uh, sims or shrimp so that means uh, the real petrographic state you know uh, and uh, you can just uh, target a mineral to identify uh, to uh, to analyze its chemical composition right so such techniques are called inside to take uh, measurements so anyway so we finally discuss about uh, the isotope uh, measurements and uh, for different isotope measurements the most of the procedures are uh, more or less similar but uh, the usages of uh, analytical reagents uh, like uh, acids are different and also their con uh, concentrations are different even if you use the same as it, but the concentrations are different. So we uh, have to do uh, some uh, test analysis uh, to de determine which composition or the which, which concentration of that particular acid and also which uh, volume is suitable for extracting these elements. So for lead extraction, uh, the volume and concentrations are different from uh, strontium or neodymium. Even rubidium strontium uh, measurements uh, for rubidium uh, separation and strontium separation are taking place at two stages. Okay, not at the same uh, same uh, same uh, proto uh, same uh, step. So uh, we have to uh, do a series of uh, uh, experiments and then decide the optimum uh, optimum concentration and the volume. And uh, we, the steps that you use for this determination of uh, optimum volume and optimum concentration are called uh, uh, illusion curves. Illusion curves. So based on the illusion curve, uh, we can determine uh, the best 
composition or the concentration of the acid and also the uh, volume. Sometimes uh, the, the, the separation of the element uh, takes place within the illusion curve. Uh, that means it's a curve. Uh, you can draw that curve uh, after doing the experiments and within that curve, if you get higher concentration covered by that particular curve, uh, then you can decide uh, the best place to uh, stop uh, the, the step or the process where you can decide, uh, okay, this much of uh, acid, uh, SG, HCl or uh, HF or whatever the reagent that you will use for that uh, is uh, sufficient or not. And also the concentration. Sometimes if at high concentration, uh, you can't uh, get optimum results. That means uh, the enough amount of uh, elements uh, are not, I mean, the particular element is not, uh, not uh, separated, right? All the separation depends on their each uh, chromatography, right? Their uh, uh, geochemical characteristics, okay? Right, so anyway, these are not that, uh, I mean, you don't have to learn about these uh, techniques and uh, the methods uh, under undergraduate level. Uh, but I just, uh, for your information, I uh, just mentioned, uh, if, in case if you do uh, higher studies uh, in uh, isotope geology, then definitely you will have to uh, go through all these protocols and all, okay? So for example, uh, in the normal ICP and MS analysis, uh, you don't have to uh, go into that detail because we are, uh, we are not uh, doing isotope analysis in our uh, laboratories, right? Uh, those IC, ICPMS are not uh, uh, not uh, sufficient for uh, uh, isotope ratio measurements, right? But uh, trace element analysis, that's fine. Or rare element analysis, it's okay. Okay, right. So now uh, we will uh, move to the last section of uh, this lecture series, uh, that is uh, under the mental isotopes and uh, uh, the traces, geochemical traces. Okay, so I will share uh, this one. The presentation, uh, can you see the presentation now? Uh, is it clear? The presentation, the font size is fine? Yes. Okay. Right, so uh, we will. Uh, we have been anyway discussing on igneous system because uh, most of these isotopic systematics uh, we uh, use in igneous systems, right? So then uh, you can apply it after, I mean, understanding different igneous processes, you can use the isotopic systematics so very frequently the people use that. And also you can apply that knowledge into uh, other systems like metamorphic systems for for sedimentary systems, it's very rarely uh, we use these uh, radiogenic isotopic systematics, but instead the uh, stable isotope uh, systematics uh, are applied in uh, some sedimentary systems. So basically for igneous systems, we use uh, these radiogenic isotopic systems and for metamorphic systems as well. You know, uh, the metamor after metamorphism, a lot of changes uh, can happen, right? Uh, diffusion and other changes can happen. So therefore isotopes can be disturbed. Therefore, uh, sometimes there is no meaning of uh, doing analysis for uh, metamorphic uh, systems, metamorphic rocks, because uh, of course we assume that the metamorphism is a closed system process by definition, but uh, we know that a lot of uh, uh, activities uh, are taking place uh, during metamorphism because especially uh, in the cases of high temperature metamorphism, a lot of uh, melting and other aspects are taking place locally and uh, variably uh, so that the system does not remain closed. So therefore, it's very difficult for us to uh, come into uh, good conclusions uh, when the system is uh, not kept uh, closed, right? Only assumptions, we have to do assumptions, but uh, even some assum assumptions might be, uh, might be wrong. But anyway, uh, if uh, some meta igneous rocks are there, that means metamorphous igneous rocks, uh, some some uh, some reasonable uh, to up to some reasonable levels, you can use the isotope systematics. Okay, right. 
right so in the com- uh, mental you know the compression and variation is there so with time over time uh, this uh, variability has happened uh, during uh, various uh, uh, cyclic processes you know melting mixing uh, those melted melts are getting mixed with uh, the other portions of the mantle and then mantle convection brings this up to shallow levels and at the shallow levels again some uh, melting happens and at the same time there may be some ocean flow uh, hydrothermal liquids are getting mixed with these magmas and then uh, getting cooled down and uh, this cool material might sink to uh, to lower levels and it might be again captured by the convective forces and taken back to mantle by this convection because it's a, a sort of a, a cyclic like so anyway this type of lot of changes can happen uh, in the mantle over the time so it means the mantle although we uh, want uh, although we like it to be homogeneous but uh, in uh, in the real nature it's uh, not uh, really homogeneous but uh, from place to place it might be Uh, homogeneous that means uh, some local variations i mean homogeneity uh, homogeneities might be there but local doesn't mean that uh, some uh, meter scale or some very very uh, small uh, area but uh, it might be some kilometer scale because uh, you know as the, if you consider the uh, s- uh, the extent of the mantle size like how many uh, how 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 big it is uh, in volume wise as well as in weight wise right so this local variation doesn't mean a few uh, meter scale or uh, anything right it might be even kilometer scale right such such possibilities are of course there and also some evidences are also uh, oh, there are many uh, for being uh, these homogeneous portions but uh, based on that uh, we can't uh, conclude that uh, the mantle is homogeneous right so anyway in general the mantle must be uh, heterogeneous because of this uh, various dynamic uh, activities taking place so <clears throat> in geochemistry in uh, hard rock geochemistry right uh, we uh, you have to understand uh, the geochemistry uh, the applications of geochemical concepts uh, there are two uh, avenues right one is the environmental uh, sample analysis environmental analysis uh, water or uh, some uh, pollution related things they also we use geochemistry right but i am not talking about that geochemistry uh, we are uh, dealing with solid rock geochemistry right mainly solid rock geochemistry chemistry means uh, that directly relates with uh, the fractionation uh, and uh, crystallization melting uh, that sort of uh, activities and also magma magma uh, magma ascent magma mixing uh, magma eruption uh, everything right during all these processes some ge- geochemical changes are happening so based on these geochemical changes people uh, used to uh, understand the nature of uh, the evolution of our planet right so our planetary evolution is understood by solid rock geochemistry and not by uh, surface geochemistry or the environmental geochemistry uh, something like that because all those uh, uh, things are superficial uh, environmental and other uh, uh, superficial uh, geochemical aspects right they are we understand uh, evolution of uh, probably some uh, shallow crustal regions it might be but not the deep interior of the earth right atmosphere and uh, hydrosphere evolution and changes uh, those things can be understood by uh, by that avenue but uh, usually petrologists and uh, uh, other uh, uh, volcanologists and uh, uh, isotope geologists uh, such uh, kind of people uh, used to uh, do uh, work on the uh, solid rock geochemistry or hard rock geochemistry right there we uh, we analyze the samples of rocks uh, at whole rock scale or uh, at mineral scale right you know uh, hard rock scale me- uh, so uh, yeah hard rock scale or b- uh, bulk rock scale means uh, when we analyze the rock sample as a whole right so you take a representative portion and then make it a homogeneous powder so that's why we we crush it and uh, then you have to make it homogeneous right 
otherwise uh, you are uh, you are reading some very local information uh, that will be misleading right so you have to select a representative sample sampling is very very important if you if you bring the wrong sample from the field then uh, there is no uh, no result i mean uh, the result you get is not uh, uh, not correct right so it's not representative and also uh, with that uh, the conclusions you arrive will be very wrong very misleading right therefore uh, representative sampling is very important whether the sample is weathered or disturbed or uh, some other reactions has happened or something like that right so you have to select the samples very carefully if you want to analyze uh, that particular sample for its petrogenesis and uh, geochemical uh, evolution right so anyway uh, you know, uh, this bulk rock analysis, uh, we use uh, trace element analysis as well as radiogenic isotope analysis. So <clears throat> using the trace element analysis, uh, normally it's very difficult uh, for us to understand about the origin or melting or crystallization processes uh, which has taken place. Uh, in some cases it's possible, but uh, uh, most of the cases, uh, just by using trace elements or rayat elements, it's not uh, very easy because they fractionate uh, very differently from one to another. Okay, uh, so during crystallization, the uh, trace elements fractionate. Fractionate means uh, if uh, you have some trace elements in the bulk rock sample, uh, but uh, if you melt that bulk rock sample, the into the melt, these trace elements which were available in the bulk rock will fractionate into. That means uh, they will go separate, preferentially partition into, they preferentially move into the melt. But uh, the amount how uh, the, the trace element uh, which can accommodate in the melt is dependent on uh, different factors, uh, valency or uh, the ionic ra radius uh, and uh, the, the surrounding conditions, environmental conditions. I mean, environmental means not the surface, but uh, the interior. Uh, these uh, oxidizing con uh, conditions, uh, whether it is uh, oxidate, oxidizing con or reducing conditions like that. So anyway, all, everything uh, uh, affects on that. That means uh, if you had two elements, uh, these two elements might be, they are in a given concentration, uh, say A and B uh, values concentration, but when it's melted, it, might, it will not be in A and B ratio in the melt. Uh, because A can have a different incompatibility and uh, compared to B. So A might be preferentially going there rather than uh, B likes to be uh, much in the solid uh, or the remaining uh, portion of the residue, right? So that means uh, uh, their uh, relative compositions will be uh, changing. So that's what we mean by fractionation, okay? So fractionation means uh, 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 the, the the entering of a particular element into a melt or even the opposite is correct when uh, a solid is crystallized from a melt uh, the same thing is uh, happening i mean uh, the from the melt uh, to the solid uh, some uh, elements can move right? that thing varies depending on various factors right so but uh, usually uh, most of the trace elements are uh, having different in, uh, incompatibilities. So therefore, they will not be there uh, in their melted product or crystallized product as they were in the uh, host or the original sample. So therefore, uh, use, using trace elements is not very easy uh, for us to uh, come into conclusions uh, regarding uh, these uh, geochemical uh, behaviors. But uh, exception is there, that is uh, what you call the canonical ratios, a special term uh, here we use uh, the canonical ratios, uh, it's, a, it's a technical term used, uh, there are some uh, particular very limited uh, ratios, uh, particularly this type of ratio, frequently uh, these uh, barium, rubidium, niobium, uranium and cerium lead. These three are very frequently used as canonical ratios. Canonical ratios means they do not vary uh, their compositions, whatever the melting or crystallization event. So usually they uh, you can find them in BEC values, bulk silicate element uh, earth values. Whatever. You know the bulk silicate earth at the primitive uh, time where the earth was formed the silicate portion of the earth form, there also you had some uh, 
uh, ratio, original ratios uh, were available at that time in the bulk silicator. Later on, due to different processes, these elements are element ratios have changed. But in the canonical ratios, whatever the process, uh, but of course, this is not 100% uh, true. Uh, canonical ratios do not usually vary. So that means barium does not go uh, preferentially. I mean, they can go preferentially, but at the same time, rubidium will also enter uh, into that uh, in the same way. So that final product will also have a similar barium rubidium ratio, something like that, right? So that applies to uh, these uh, particular ratios. And this was. Uh, uh, this particular geochemical feature was in, uh, identified in the uh, 1980s. Uh, I, can't, uh, I, uh, I can't exactly remember the name of the person who discovered it, uh, a famous scientist. Uh, anyway, uh, so these are uh, some exceptions. Uh, otherwise, uh, using trace elements uh, alone is very difficult uh, to understand the uh, melting and crystallization processes because they behave very, very differently uh, uh, with uh, respect to each other. But radiogenic isotopes, in, other, uh, in, uh, in contrast, uh, what they uh, do is, uh, I mean, uh, what we do uh, in radiogenic isotope measurements is uh, we take radiogenic isotope to non-radiogenic isotope uh, ratios, yes, right? So that's why we have uh, always, uh, uh, radiogenic isotope over non-radiogenic isotope as a ratio, right? So they provide a very good record of uh, different events. I mean, ancient event because uh, ancient means uh, the in the past event, right? Uh, so uh, they might not have been erased by other secondary or later processes, but that is also one uh, one condition. There shouldn't have been. Uh, later processes that uh, that has uh, overprinted or obliterated uh, the original uh, features, right? But uh, anyway, uh, if uh, we can uh, have uh, some uh, reasonable assumptions, uh, we may uh, take these radiogenic isotope ratios to understand the uh, fast events, ancient events. Okay, but even if uh, they have been subsequently disturbed, that also can be understood, right? So suppose uh, one original rocks, uh, rock was there and uh, its isotope ratio is known, but later uh, when we uh, discover that uh, particular sample from a seabed or somewhere, uh, we take the measurement and uh, try to get its isotope ratio, but uh, uh, it might be different from the expected value that we uh, uh, used to know of that particular sample. So then uh, you can uh, figure out what has happened, right? For that, you have to use this uh, radiogenic tracer concept or uh, the radiogenic isotopes in uh, this uh, understanding of these uh, different processes, right? As a tracers. So in uh, understanding such kind of ancient events, I mean, not only the original melting or something, but even later uh, disturbances, maybe another magma, uh, it mixed with another magma or otherwise uh, some uh, during ascent of this magma, uh, it reacted with the country rock, the surrounding rock, the crustal rock, uh, something like that, right? So this type of, uh, uh, this type of, uh, uh, this type of uh, changes can also be, uh, happening uh, due to uh, these uh, uh, these uh, different processes. So therefore, uh, radiogenic isotopes are very, very uh, characteristic and very important uh, to understand uh, the evolution of uh, uh, different uh, units, uh, crustal or mantle units. And also, unlike uh, the trace elements, uh, they do not uh, easily fractionate, fractionate from each other, right? So therefore, uh, the ratio itself uh, remains as it is unless uh, some later disturbances did, did not happen. So therefore, uh, original source rock characteristic must be uh, visible from uh, a later product, right? Uh, for example, uh, if you 
uh, get some sample or some melting from a, a depleted mantle DMM. Uh, uh, you must be able to trace that DMM signature or the DMM uh, characteristics uh, from the sample that you discover from the ocean floor. Right? DMM is elsewhere, right? but you are collecting the sample from the ocean floor. Maybe it's a mid-ocean rich basalt. Uh, you take that sample, analyze it, and if you uh, get the DMM signature, the same isotopic uh, characteristics, then you know that. Uh, definitely this uh, this is a product of uh, the dmm region of the mantle right but you collect the sample in that very shallow level of the crust right so like that uh, such uh, characteristics are there radiogenic in a, uh, radiogenic isotopes unlike uh, trace elements so that is the important uh, other important uh, uh, use uh, of uh, these uh, radiogenic isotopes and therefore we uh, sometimes use the radiogenic isotopes are the fingerprints of uh, these uh, sources of uh, the rocks right because they act as a fingerprint so your fingerprint does not change right wherever you put your finger it will have the same mark uh, so it is a unique identifier so something like that so therefore uh, these radiogenic isotopes are very important uh, in understanding uh, various igneous systems okay so this is uh, a very uh, very uh, valid and very uh, important uh, concept and uh, people have variably used this concept uh, for understanding different crustal and mantle processes so uh, as you know as i mentioned before the radiogenic uh, daughter uh, to non-radiogenic isotope that's how we uh, denote a uh, denote an isotope ratio right if you take the uh, uh, r as an isotope ratio so what you have is uh, a radiogenic daughter uh, divided by non-radiogenic isotope, right? So for example, rubidium, you take rubidium, rubidium is a parent atom, right? So from that with time, uh, you decay uh, it into strontium, right? 87 strontium. So strontium 87 is there as the radiogenic daughter, but we uh, just strontium 87 we don't uh, try to measure it's very also difficult we are making measuring isotope ratios is easy then measuring uh, iso uh, atoms isotopes of uh, i mean uh, just single atoms it's uh, not easy to measure therefore we that's why we measure as uh, uh, ratios and uh, we have a non-radiogenic isotope what is the non-radiogenic isotope in strontium it's 86 strontium, right? So 87 strontium divided by 86 uh, strontium uh, gives you uh, the strontium isotopic signature, right? Uh, so that is the parent uh, daughter decay uh, process. So, <clears throat> but you know, uh, the both the parent and daughter being two elements, they might be having different uh, incompatibility. Okay, different incompatibility. So, what is different incompatibility? They uh, they, uh, they they fractionate differently. Okay, they fractionate differently uh, from one another, right? Because they are just uh, two uh, trace elements. But uh, uh, but the ratio of radiogenic uh, isotope to non-radiogenic isotope in a rock or a mineral, it can be either in a rock or a mineral. That's why I mentioned that uh, this uh, solid rock geochemistry is dealing with uh, a whole rock scale, the entire rock crushed and then analyzed or something like that, or just the mineral, right? Whether crushed or not, uh, the mineral, uh, you can uh, have in both. But anyway, the ratio of radiogenic to non-radiogenic isotopes in a, uh, in a rock uh, or a mineral uh, do not vary uh, easily uh, because of these uh, incompatibilities because uh, we are talking about two isotopes not just two elements okay therefore almost uh, constant ratio you can expect from these uh, isotope parent daughter isotope uh, ratios so therefore uh, radiogenic to non-radiogenic isotopes in a rock or mineral uh, directly reflects the composition of the source, right, from which it was formed, right. So that's why we mention it as a fingerprint, right. It should be having the same characteristic 
uh, as its source, right? So that's why I took the example from uh, DMM, uh, the depleted mantle, uh, when a rock is produced from DMA, uh, you get the sample in uh, the uh, in the uh, ocean flow because uh, DMA produces melt mid ocean rich basalt, more basalt, and it's dumped to the ocean flow somewhere, right? So when you collect that sample and if you get the same isotopic signature, then you know that this is identical. The isotopic composition is identical, and then uh, this particular lava or magma or the, uh, the, the material that uh, was produced, uh, that particular rock is a uh, initial product of, uh, initial uh, product of uh, the mantle, DMM region, right? Depleted mantle region, something like that. So that means uh, it should reflect the composition of the source. So it's a, a very important point there. We, we use the radiogenic isotopes to understand the source characteristic, okay? So that's very important. And uh, at the same time, uh, if you take this point, uh, high R, high R means what? High radiogenic uh, daughter to radi uh, non radiogenic isotope ratio. That means uh, the high isotopic ratios uh, 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 over the time, right? If you have high value means, uh, for example, if you have a strontium 87, this one, if you have a strontium 87, uh, to uh, strontium 86, uh, very high value, right? Maybe 10, 20, 30 instead of uh, 0.7, uh, something like that, right? If you have very high value, it does mean that uh, it records a high time integrated parent daughter ratio, right? Because, you know, uh, strontium 87 is produced from what? 87 rubidium, okay? So this is parent and this is daughter. So high. Uh, strontium ratio means high overall ratio means you must have decayed many rubidium into strontium okay a lot of rubidium have been uh, decayed into strontium 87 so that is the implication over the time right so high time integrated uh, decay right production of uh, uh, this uh, particular isotope uh, component right so it's a part of uh, the history of uh, that particular source mantle mantle or whatever the source right so it indicates uh, the this particular sample has suffered a long term evolution over a long period of time not a very young uh, product right it means a very old product it may have survived during uh, all these uh, tectonic or dynamic activities in the Earth's interior, somehow it has remained and uh, now showing the original uh, composition, right? But uh, since uh, it has elapsed a long time, you know, uh, the time integrated uh, 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 accumulation of uh, uh, the daughter products are getting more high and high, right? Because uh, each, uh, each rubidium uh, atom will produce each uh, one uh, strontium 87 atom, right? So one uh, decay of 187 rubidium cause one new strontium 87 to produce, right? So that is what you call the time integrated devolution. So there you have time, high time integrated devolution ratio because you know this uh, lower value, this 86 strontium is non radiogenic It does not change. But only thing what is changing is this, uh, this one, right? So definitely that must be relating with the time integrated evolution of uh, rubidium into strontium. So like that, right? So we have to understand that sort of uh, uh, facts as well when you analyze an isotope ratio from a, uh, from a rock. But uh, all these things uh, will be valid if the system kept closed, okay? If the system kept closed only, uh, we can think of uh, all these uh, uh, all these uh, assumptions and all these uh, interpretations, right? But in case of uh, open systems, as you know, which is the most uh, natural and most uh, uh, available, uh, I mean, uh, possibilities available are for open system than uh, closed system because a lot of melting can disturb these, uh, uh, these original compositions and like that, right? So in such cases, uh, although you get <coughs> some value as the present day isotopic value, 
but it might not reflect the real original comp uh, composition of the source. So that is very, very important. So they, that's why we can't really uh, or solely depend uh, depend on the stop ratio alone, right? Because uh, you are getting a number only. You are getting, but of course, it is a uh, real physical counts of these isotope values in the machine. But uh, you never know uh, what has happened to this rock uh, in the past, right? So therefore, uh, solid rock geochemists or hard rock geochemists, uh, petrologists, isotope geologists, they never want to be dependent on just by numbers, right? They do not depend on just by numbers. So that's why uh, always this isotope geology is connected with the petrological interpretations because the petrology is the real record of the rock. So if uh, the rock has subjected to various changes uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the past, it should reflect these ones as uh, recorded there in, the, uh, in uh, mineral textures, right? So melting or uh, recrystallization or whatever uh, the new textures will be uh, overprinting the existing texture. So therefore, uh, petrological in investigation is very, very important before you go into uh, isotopic analysis. And also before you go even into trace element analysis, it is the best way is to uh, do a comprehensive petrological observation and in investigation of the rock. And then you understand uh, what might have happened to the rock, right? Rather than be dependent on just numbers uh, given by uh, an ICPMS or uh, team so whatever okay so anyway so if uh, a closed system was there if a closed system was there so original ratios should be uh, maintaining because eight, 187 rubidium will produce 187 uh, strontium right so likewise it will uh, it will uh, not change the ratios uh, significantly but if uh, an open system was there so original composition was this but it will be disturbed. It will be changing from time to time, right? Based uh, because uh, the system was not uh, closed, right? So therefore, uh, this type of uh, interpretations uh, might not be valid for open systems. But even for open systems, sometimes uh, it's very useful uh, to use uh, even these modified isotopic compositions because uh, we may be able to identify some patterns. Right. Based on those patterns, geochemical patterns, we can uh, figure out what has happened. Right. Uh, for example, there may be some reactions taking place. So in that case, uh, with what uh, this particular rock has reacted uh, and uh, to what extent it has happened like that, you can even mathematically model. So these type of uh, applications are there. So therefore, whether it is closed system or open system doesn't matter for a solid rock geochemist. So uh, if uh, he has a, a sound uh, petrological interpretation, then he can embark into the isotopic analysis, trace element analysis and isotopic analysis. Uh, of course, uh, after trace element analysis only, you should go for isotopic analysis because you have to know uh, about your general uh, concentrations of your elements before you go to isotopic measurements. Uh, that's a practical thing. Uh, which uh, I'm not going to elaborate here, but uh, just keep in mind that isotopes should come at last, okay? Otherwise, uh, interpretations will be very, very difficult and uh, maybe not uh, valid even. Okay, so uh, I think uh, we, we discussed uh, quite a lot up to now. Uh, if you have anything uh, unclear, you can just ask me. No questions? You must ask questions. Okay, so we'll move on then. <clears throat> okay, so we will uh, we will consider now in detail about radiogenic isotopes as petrogenetic and geochemical indicators. So uh, I think uh, now you have the background for that. 
uh, because uh, I, we mentioned that uh, what is changing uh, and what is uh, not changing. That means what can be used as a fingerprint or what can be used as a uh, uh, other other uh, process indicators uh, such as uh, mixing or secondary melting or some other processes. Okay, so these are called geochemical and uh, geochemical indicators or petrogenetic indicators because petrogenetic means uh, something uh, contributed to formation of the rocks. Right, so understanding of that process. Right, uh, so in mixtures, uh, radiogenic isotopes and even other mixtures, uh, besides age and source information, right, even uh, we talked about uh, ages uh, previously at the very beginning, and also Elakisa has uh, taught you, right, how to obtain uh, or how to derive ages from isotopes, right. So besides from that, that aspect, just the age determination, and also besides from source information. So that is what uh, just I informed you a uh, little while ago, right? Still, isotope ratios can be used to understanding the mixtures. So that is another uh, advantage of uh, the usage of isotope uh, ratios uh, in uh, different petrogenetic systems, right? So besides age information and also besides the source information, whether it is coming from DMM or whether it is coming from HIMU or what has uh, contributed uh, uh, immensely for a particular rock to form, whether it's EM uh, affected or EM1 or EM2 or something like that, right? Those are source information. So besides those, uh, we can use uh, to unmix a mixture. So what do you mean by that? Do you understand? We have mixtures. Mixtures means what? We have uh, different components uh, dissolved uh, together, right? In a single uh, setting. But if you want to know uh, what components contributed to this mixture, whether it is sugar and tea only, or whether it is sugar, tea plus coffee, or something like that, right? If you want to unmix your mixture, that means you have to reverse uh, what has happened to the mixture, right? It's something like uh, doing uh, undoing, like in a computer, right? You uh, you unmix. You, you I mean, you have to understand what uh, what has contributed to this particular mixture, right? For that understanding, also uh, we can use uh, the radiogenic isotope. So this is very important. Uh, this usage uh, because uh, we. Uh, we can resolve so many questions uh, which are unanswered uh, in the uh, geological field, in geochemical field. Okay, so therefore, this uh, application of radiogenic isotopes in mixtures, in uh, geo geological mixtures, uh, is very very important. Okay, although we consider about mixtures, uh, currently it might not be a so uh, liquid. Okay. It might be a rock, just a rock. Now it's uh, crystallized, solid now, right? But still, it's a product of a mixture, right? So we have to, uh, you can unmix it to find out what has contributed uh, to form that particular uh, mixture. So anyway, either, whether it's a, it's a liquid or a solid, uh, a mix, uh, the, to understand the mixtures, uh, we can use the radiogenic isotope, uh, isotopes, uh, in different phase, right? Different systematic, uh, different systematics can be used. So systematics means isotope ratio uh, values and how they behave uh, like that, right? With respect to different each and every isotope, is rubidium, strontium, samarium, neodymium. So uh, if you want to do lutetium hafnium isotopes, then you call it lutetium hafnium systematics, right? Isotope systematics. So that's the technical term uh, we use. Okay. Right. Uh, so whatever uh, these mixtures uh, to identify, I mean, uh, to, to understand their uh, uh, past history, uh, you can use uh, all these uh, common isotopic uh, ratios, right? Uh, rubidium strontium, uh, samarium neodymium, uh, lead lead isotopic systematics, as well as uh, lutetium hafnium, uh, rhenium osmium, right? There are several uh, isotope systems that uh, are new to you, right? Rubidium, strontium, samarium, neodymium, and lead, like things are very common to you and uh, we, we, we studied in detail. But uh, 
Lutetium hafnium and uh, rhenium osmium, uh, we do not do, do much in detail because they have uh, some more um, some more characteristic uh, features uh, and uh, which are not very common like uh, what you have in uh, samarium neodymium or rubidium strontium isotopic systematics. Right? So therefore, anyway, uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, very useful uh, to apply these radiogenic isotopes as uh, to understand uh, mixtures, geochemical mixtures. Okay, so what are these mixtures? What kind of mixtures can be there in igneous systems? Right. Usually, these mixtures are produced as a result of melting, right? Of mantle mo most of the time, right? Uh, because the mantle uh, always subject to uh, melt. Right, partial melting, right? So that produces magma. So in the Earth's interior, you know, every time there are magma generation because of high heat, high pressure, uh, high radiogenic heat. And also you can remember, I think uh, in the depth, uh, this decaying of isotopes cause a lot of heat to accumulate. So that's the very uh, large quantity of heat we have remaining in the Earth's interior is because of uh, radiogenic, uh, decay right not just the uh, the earth's uh, accretion heat right at the time of uh, earth's uh, formation right a lot of radiogenic isotopes have accumulated uh, heat uh, so far because you know we were i mean the earth was formed about 4.5 billion years ago right during this 4.5 billion years a lot of radiogenic decays has uh, have taken place in the interior so everything accumulates heat and uh, it's a very, very slow cooling process is there inside, right? Unless uh, the rock comes to the surface as a volcano or uh, as a mid-ocean ridge basalt or whatever, right? Otherwise it will remain as it uh, in, the, in the interior and being uh, high uh, pressure and high temperature uh, geothermal conditions, uh, these uh, uh, rocks will not easily cool down. Okay, so therefore, and also the magmas are not, uh, not solidified unless they come to shallow levels, right? So therefore, uh, this uh, mantle melting uh, can uh, cause different, uh, uh, different uh, melting products and uh, they will be, if undisturbed, they will be showing the real mantle characteristics they were originated from. Uh, from their uh, this uh, secondary products, but unfortunately, if uh, later processes like while this melting uh, taking place and when uh, the melted uh, volume comes up to the shallow level, uh, it can react with the crustal sections and also even mantle component. It can meet uh, some subsequent uh, components in the middle, right? Because you can have a crust. You can have uh, some mantle uh, sections, some mantle fragments. You remember uh, we talked about the recycling of material, right? Recycling material means uh, the shallow uh, level mantle materials going down to uh, the deep interior and uh, they get changed and come back again as another uh, product, right? So this can happen cyclically, okay? So when a magma, uh, produces produced by uh, the mantle in the uh, deeper level this magma will come up and sometimes they hit with these uh, components and they, they might uh, be reacting with those uh, uh, with the, the 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 mantle or the whatever yeah mantle component that you meet uh, on the way upwards to the shallow levels and even they might come up and meet the crust and during this crust uh, mantle melt meeting uh, there can be some reactions taking place right because of uh, crustal uh, effect because the crust is totally different from the mantle so they are not stable so they can react each other and produce a new thing right so that is what you call the crustal contamination right so within the crust it reacts so that is what you call the contamination or in other words, assimilation also, right? Sometimes uh, when this uh, melt comes up, uh, the surrounding crustal section become uh, some reacted, right? Some so reaction zone is produced, right? So this is what we call the assimilation, 
right? So either assimilation or contamination can make uh, this magma to change when it is coming from uh, the deep interior. So that in that case, uh, this magma, which is found in this level, will not reflect uh, its source characteristics, which was uh, produced at this uh, depth. Okay, because of uh, the the disturbances. If there were no disturbances, they will have a identical isotropic composition at the shallow levels. So uh, uh, this type of uh, processes, uh, I mean, uh, even if you uh, apply the isotope uh, systematics, you can even uh, understand about this uh, contamination processes as well, what has happened at shallow levels, whether it is one stage or two stage. But most of the cases, if you have multiple stages like this, right, the most recent uh, stage will be preserved in the rock. Right? All the other previous events might be uh, erased. Right? We can't uh, control it anyway. But the most recent change will be remaining. Right? So at least up to this level, you can uh, think of a history of this particular rock, what has happened using the radiogenic isotopes. But rarely, some portions of this sample might be showing original characteristics and also the uh, first melting or uh, changing event information right so for that you have to have a very very uh, careful uh, petrologic uh, investigation uh, and then uh, you have to measure very precisely the isotropic compositions then also uh, then uh, actually you can uh, find out multiple stages uh, that particular rock has suffered right of uh, events multiple events that has suffered right so this type of uh, uh, things are there which we call the contamination or assimilation anyway so in uh, such cases say that means uh, contamination or assimilation or, or forming mixtures okay so they represent melt uh, melts drawn from more than one source right so you remember here uh, up to this level up to this level it's uh, from a one source right but from there onwards it's contaminated so now another uh, source has contributed to its uh, geochemistry, right? Now a modified magma is uh, going up, right? Now a modified magma is traveling up. So that mag magma has two, uh, should have two source characteristics with respect to this as well as uh, the other, other source, right? So likewise, uh, we can find out uh, in some ways uh, whether these are mixtures of just two components like this here uh, here one and the second component is here oh otherwise as another component like here right if another process has happened right so like uh, like this we can resolve out uh, what has happened so it's uh, what i use uh, that time was unmixing right so you can use unmixing uh, for a mixture to understand whether it has uh, subjected to multiple uh, changes, geochemical changes, right? So it's uh, it's possible uh, to uh, understand whether it's uh, two component or uh, three component or even uh, bigger than, uh, even uh, more than that, okay? So uh, for that uh, understanding also, we use the radiogenic isotopes uh, in a lot of uh, geochemical interpretations. Right. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So I think uh, you should understand uh, the applications of these radiogenic isotopes. Uh, so now you realize that they are not just used for age dating, right? Age dating is a very, very preliminary thing uh, that we use to find out a simple number, right? Age number. But uh, uh, apart from that, we can uh, apply that knowledge the isotropic knowledge to understand so many uh, petrogenic processes which is taking place in the earth's interior okay right is it clear up to this point so please uh, let me know you have to answer you have to give the feedback to me is it clear <coughs> yes yes Okay. So uh, just if I forget, 
uh, i think uh, you are ready for physical examinations today today i will uh, send you the examination timetable uh, so uh, make sure that uh, you will have places to uh, accommodate and uh, for isotop geochemistry you will have uh, end semester examination as well as you will have a quiz right extra hour will be used and you will have a quiz as well because uh, we didn't have uh, sufficient uh, evaluation because uh, we we gave some online assignments and other things but uh, you know those are all open book right they will not uh, assess you properly so therefore uh, we have decided to uh, give you a quiz as well at the end of uh, of course if uh, we can give a quiz now right now or just a week or two before would be very good but uh, you know you can't come uh, physically you know so therefore uh, we had to wait, we, we had to wait until uh, you come to the university right so at least uh, when you come for the exam so we will have the uh, ncms exam uh, plus a quiz uh, which will be considered as an as, uh, as an uh, as a continuous assessment right so plus uh, that mark uh, quiz mark plus uh, the assignment marks uh, will uh, sum up like 30 percent or so and then uh, for the end semester you will get the final uh, the remaining mark and final uh, grading will be uh, ready with uh, that final mark okay so you have to go through your notes very carefully and also you have to read extra uh, from at the moment what you can do is uh, you have to do uh, the internet references uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, resources available and also uh, you can download papers uh, uh, you don't have to get the subscription uh, which is accepted through the sci-hub you know sci-hub does anybody know about sci-hub sci-hub yes sir yeah so you can download from there okay it's it's now um, getting uh, i mean it's almost like legal site now because now it's established site so therefore no problem you can uh, access to the university network as well uh, and uh, you can download them okay <clears throat> right so these mixtures can be uh either one uh, two member or even multiple members more than that right the simplest mixture is one and uh, i mean uh, two uh, n members otherwise it is not a mixture right so that's why uh, we use its component mixing right okay so uh, as i mentioned uh, we can use these radiogenic isotopes uh, in uh, mixtures to understand their mixtures uh, so uh, these uh, mixtures can be formed from a single source, as I mentioned before, but may have experienced uh, different additional inputs or events uh, during the ascent, right? During the ascent means uh, coming up to the shallow level, right? Or otherwise, uh, during the storage. What is storage here? What do you mean by storage there? Yeah. yeah, quickly tell me what could be the storage. What is the storage? It's a magma chamber. Okay. It's a magma chamber. You know magma chamber? Uh, when uh, the melting is uh, happening, uh, then after melting, uh, actually drops of melts accumulate together. Okay. First of all, drops of melts are formed and they get accumulated and then uh, they uh, form more bigger melt. Uh, components and they uh, connect each other to uh, together and make a melt conduit okay so this melt conduit is uh, you know uh, less dense compared to its uh, surrounding residue uh, so therefore it has the ability to move upwards due to density difference right being uh, this liquid is shallow uh, the light so it it comes up as a magma, uh, what as a magma flow 
or magma, uh, yeah, magma flow, uh, we term this path as a conduit, right? Magma conduit, right? Along this, this magma come up and at shallow level, when it reaches uh, some kilometers down, like uh, five to 10 kilometers deep from the surface, what happens is they, uh, because of uh, pressure, low pressure regions, because uh, when it comes to shallow levels, uh, it's low pressure regions, right? Here it's sweet, uh, in very highly squeezed, right? Very high pressures are there at deeper levels. But anyway, when it comes to shallow level, what happens is they get more relaxed, right? So gradually what happens is they, uh, this magma flow uh, makes a place like a tank, okay? So this is what we call the magma chamber. So here, <clears throat> this magma is uh, pumping little by little and this magma chamber is produced little by little, right? And not at once it makes a reservoir, right? So gradually it fills up, gradually it fills up. And uh, when it is fully occupied by this uh, magmas, right? It, um, it's uh, totally filled, then it, uh, uh, move further upward okay until that time it's uh, closed the magma chamber is closed normally right it's a it's a tank it's a storage that's why it's called a storage right then we, it's uh, when it's fully uh, filled uh, no more it can bear and uh, it will erupt some fissures or some fractures may form and then uh, it uh, erupts like uh, to form a volcano right that's how a high pressure eruption can take place, right? So that is the storage. So uh, even uh, some changes can happen to these uh, melts, which was produced at the uh, very beginning. So in the middle, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, there can be some mixing events, some contamination or some reactions, right? So similarly, uh, during the storage time also, because they stay some time, some years, some millions of years, it might stay without uh, anything, right? very calm, very calm region, but all of a sudden it uh, tries to erupt, right? Because uh, continuous pumping is there. Continuous pumping of magma is uh, down there. So it uh, reaches a time where it cannot uh, anymore tolerate, right? So it will make fractures uh, and then some seismic uh, waves, uh, even uh, explosions, right? Then it comes as a uh, lava flow uh, to the surface as an as a volcanic eruption. Okay, so during all these processes, uh, <clears throat> uh, these additional inputs means such processes, right? During ascent, so they are uh, they can be subjected to uh, different uh, different uh, subsequent processes, and uh, their original composition might be getting changed. But uh, some uh, some cases we may be able to identify. Uh, these multiple events also, right? So at least the most recent one, the last uh, event should be uh, identifiable uh, in uh, this type of rocks, right? So if you have two components, right? For example, you have the original, say this is a mantle, a DMMM, a DMM or uh, high mu or whatever, that, that is one component. The other component is, the components that uh, interact with this one, uh, maybe uh, another mantle section or another crustal section or during the storage, maybe some uh, previously formed magma because you have a lot of uh, magma accumulated here and their compositions are now different because uh, uh, they have different compositions and come up and store here, right? Uh, like uh, you make uh, different uh, water colors into one, uh, uh, one cup, Right? different colors into one cup. So you get uh, a fully messed, uh, messed composition, right? So likewise, so there may be several sources afterwards, right? So likewise, there can be uh, <coughs> sources and uh, these uh, sources will have their own characteristics. Uh, that means say, uh, suppose A and B, component A and B, uh, two components are there. So based on their parameters, uh, this uh, mixing uh, will, uh, will have a, a uh, different uh, result. So if uh, they are uh, usually two components, right? If they are two components, uh, they uh, tend to make some uh, mixing uh, curves, right? They uh, try to, they show 
uh, some mixing curves. So actually, uh, what we do is we analyze the mixture, right? We don't know how many components are there, right? We don't know how many components are there, but what we do is we take uh, measurements in the final product, right? Say this is a uh, basalt you collect from motion flow, right? You take it and you measure the uh, com composition. Composition means isotopic composition, maybe the strontium ratio. And then you make uh, some graphs, right? You make some graphs. How can you make this graph? Strontium composition of uh, A and strontium composition of B, like that like uh, two components, but uh, in the component wise, you take the measurements, right? Then you uh, get some values plotted in a space, right? So if they are real mixtures, and if you have used uh, some particular uh, ratios, because this ratio is also very important to determine the nature of this curve, right? Whether it's a straight line or a uh, hyperbola, or uh, some other type of a curve like that, right? It all depends on the ratio you use in these two axes, okay? So that is very, very important. So normally, for most of the components, if uh, there are only two components, they might be showing a linear pattern, okay? They might be showing a linear pattern, but it doesn't mean that all the mixtures will show linear patterns. Usually they are hyperbolic. These uh, mixing curves are hyperbolic in most of the cases, but you can reduce this hyperbola into a straight line, uh, doing some changes, right? Doing some changes because uh, that will uh, make us easy to interpret the, your, uh, this data. If otherwise, if it's a hyperbola, then how can you understand uh, the behavior in, uh, in places like uh, here and here? Because you know the curvature is different. You have a different curvature, and there is no correlation that you can easily uh, consider, right? So therefore, if you can make it into a straight line, then uh, you may be having some very clear plots uh, like that. So then maybe you can have a very very reasonable uh, uh, reasonable uh, distribution. Okay. So like that, you can do some modifications, uh, some modifications to the original, uh, uh, the, the parameters that you are using and then uh, come up, come into different interpretations. But uh, this type of mixing calculations and mixing uh, studies were extensively done by uh, a, a researcher called Langmuir. Uh, in the Langmu uh, in his group, he's a US uh, scientist, and uh, he uh, he recognized some mixing patterns uh, with respect to various compositions of uh, various samples, many samples, uh, because you don't know what kind of uh, interactions they have suffered uh, during their ascent, right? So he collected so many samples at different set uh, settings and uh, uh, came up with uh, uh, some mathematical models. And this was published first in 1978 in the Earth, Earth and Planetary Science Letters. It's a prestigious journal uh, dedicated for Earth science. Uh, so there, uh, this uh, paper uh, was published, right? So original equation uh, or two, uh, uh, an equation uh, for uh, having two components, right? Uh, he presented uh something like this right so this equation uh, can be used to uh, find out uh, unknown compositions okay of a mixture right if you know uh, some components of the mixture uh, unknown components uh, can be found right there are different applications of this uh, or totally you can't uh, find uh, compositions but uh, applying the result of what you get might be able to uh, figure out what has happened to the rock sample, right? So this is a, a common uh, type of an equation. Actually, this means uh, uh, the isotope or whatever the uh, value that you have in A, uh, in terms of A in the mixture, right? Uh, the value of B in the mixture. That means uh, the two values that you use for X and Y, A and B are those, right? Uh, if you take strontium isotopes here 
And if you take rubidium uh, here, then A is strontium, B is rubidium, or something like that. Okay. So like likewise, right? So A two and A one uh, means uh, uh, the component compositions. I mean uh, the composition of uh, uh, A in second component, right? Because a, uh, this capital A and capital B means the mixture values, right? It's the mixture value because you are talking about the mixture here. But here you are entirely talking about the N member. So these are the N members, right? You, you can remember N members in solid solutions, right? Remember uh, 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 albite and othite, right? Those are N members, right? So for example, if you take a, a mixture of a plagioclase, Calcium compo composition in the mixture means uh, CA mix. You can write CA mix, calcium mix in the mixture. But uh, the two N members are albite and anothite, right? One and two are albite and anothite. So calcium in albite component, calcium in anothite component, something like that, right? So likewise, anyway, uh, there, there was an uh, equation uh, formulated. And uh, we some uh, you don't need to uh, bother about this equation because uh, you are not supposed to apply this equation in your undergraduate level. But uh, just for your understanding, uh, I presented this equation. But uh, basically, what you have to know is uh, these concepts. Okay, uh, these uh, normal concepts you have to understand. Right. Uh, so most of the cases uh, you you can see different types of uh, mixing curves. Right. Usually it's a uh, hyperbolic array, right? Usually it's a hyperbolic array. So you can see some hyperbolic shapes, uh, different hyperbolic shapes, right? In different ways, uh, all are hyperboles. Why we call it hyperbole is, you know, there's a particular equation for the hyperbole, right? Like uh, for a straight line, you have an equation Y equals uh, MX plus C, right? Like that for the hyperbole also you have an equation, right? Uh, for the parabola, also you have an equation. For uh, for other curves, also you can define equations. Likewise, right? So anyway, uh, those equations are e similar to these ones, right? Those uh, these equations are particularly derived from uh, those mathematical expressions using mathematical equations of uh, different curves, right? So now, uh, if you have two components mixing together, right? Uh, if we have a very st nice straight line, then it's very very uh, good. But as I said uh, previously, all depends on uh, this X and Y parameters. What, what are the X and Y parameters that you use, right? So it doesn't mean that all the two components must uh, indicate a straight line. No, it's not like that. It to entirely depends on what parameter you are choosing here, right? For some parameters, two components uh, always show straight line, but for some parameters, but for many parameters, it does not. Usually they show some hyperbolic arrays, but you can reduce this into a straight line in uh, after processing some, uh, some ways are there. But uh, without uh, artificially doing that, you can naturally get uh, a straight line uh, using, uh, using uh, this uh, component also. I will, I will tell you, and also you will realize uh, when you go from uh, this one diagram to another. Right, so okay, we, let's see the first one. Here you have component A divided by component P uh, versus component B, right? So what is this? This is uh, actually uh, 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 like uh, strontium 87 divided by uh, strontium 86 versus uh, in x-axis, you may get strontium alone, only strontium, something like that. So like this, uh, you can define different uh, components. So otherwise you can have uh, A to C versus B to D, entirely different uh, values, entirely different two values, right? Entirely different values. Although you have two components, A and uh, one and two, the, those are the components, but in one, you can have trace elements, you can have isotopes, you can have uh, trace element ratios, right? Likewise, you can take uh, so many components there. I mean, sorry, so many uh, species there, compositional varieties, compositional species there. Uh, for example, here, this may be strontium uh, isotope value, strontium divided by, I mean, 87 strontium divided by 86 uh, strontium. But this might be 
uh, uh, samarium to neodymium, right? Entirely different one, BD, right? This is AC, but uh, component A in one, component C in one. This is component B in one. This is component D in uh, oh, uh, what item D in uh, one, uh, one, sorry, D in two, right? This is the second component. This is the uh, first component. So like that, uh, different uh, components or different uh, species uh, belonging to uh, different uh, components you can take, right? Because uh, you can take this component as a single rock, right? You take this as a single rock and you may do a lot of analysis. You can do trace element analysis, you can do rubidium strontium analysis, you can do uh, samarium neodymium analysis, like that. So you take uh, lead, supposedly you take lead analysis, then you take lead over uh, another element, uh, cerium. You remember uh, we talked about canonical ratios. Lead cerium is a canonical ratio. But uh, you can take this uh, like this. That means in the component one, you measure the lead composition, right? This is component one. At the same time, you measure cerium composition also in the same component, right? right? So these are two different species, uh, chemical species in the component. And you put it in y axis. And similarly, you take the measurements and uh, you do the same for the uh, component number two. Right? So simply one means one type of a rock and two means another type of a rock. Right? So then you uh, try to figure out what has happened to its uh, chemistry, whether you can uh, whether you can find a relationship or like a very beautiful uh, or relation or something like that. You have to look into right? like even like this, right? Okay, this is entirely different uh, four species, but here entirely different two species in two components right we have a we have b right and we take the ratio of that in y-axis but we take only b here in the x-axis right b in uh, component two uh, b in component one likewise uh, you can take uh, the different uh, values right so at the same time what you can do is uh, you take uh, a species in component one and uh, C uh, in component one, and you can take B in component two, uh, B in component uh, C in component two, like that also, right? But here, only uh, only thing is you have the same component in the denominator. You have the same component in the denominator. Right? That is uh, one important point. But here you didn't have it in the uh, denominator. You have the same component, but not in the denominator. It's in the numerator. Right? So you are having a parabola, parabolic, uh, sorry, hyper hyperbolic uh, uh, behavior. Even here, you have entirely different components, but you have hyperbolic uh, arrays, two hyperbolic arrays, different hyperbolic arrays. But here, you have the same component in the denominator. Right? It's something like uh, you have rubidium over strontium right? in uh, y-axis, right? rubidium over strontium in y-axis. And what is in x-axis? You are taking strontium, is it correct? No, because you have to get it into the denominator, not in the numerator like here. If you take just strontium, that is like this, right? rubidium strontium over uh, versus strontium then here in this way. But here it's in denominator or in other words, what you call it? The reciprocal, okay? The reciprocal, the reciprocal of uh, the, the uh, concentration, reciprocal of uh, here, the strontium. That means one over strontium. If you take one over strontium uh, versus uh, rubidium over strontium ratio, I right? Uh, you may take this as isotope or even trace elements, this is valid, right? Even for just trace element ratios, this is valid, right? So then definitely you will end up with a straight line, okay? So these are these can be proved using these type of uh, equations, uh, but which uh, you don't need to do it. Uh, so these all these, uh, that's what I mentioned that you can uh, reduce the hyperbola into a straight line.
So this is how we treat the results or the, treat the uh, our readings and uh, make it uh, an easily interpretable way, right? So that will getting reduced to a uh, straight line. So that is uh, very, very important, okay? Okay, so these uh, parameters can be either uh, elemental concentrations or isotope uh, concentrations or even mixture of elements and isotopes. So that means trace elements and isotopes, right? So this is uh, this is uh, another important aspect uh, that we how uh, that we uh, how deal with uh, these mixtures, isotopic mix. Uh, I mean uh, mixtures to understand the mixtures. So isotope ratios are. Uh, very very important uh, in uh, this type of mixing applications okay right so up to this point how about uh, uh, you understand is it all right if you have a question you can ask me and also, if you don't understand, also you can raise your hand, or you can just uh, uh, tell me. Be because these are very, very uh, basic uh, aspects with uh, related to this uh, application of radiogenic isotopes in uh, different geochemical uh, interpretations. Right? These are very, very inter important interpretations you can arrive using these compositions. But uh, at the undergraduate level, you are not supposed to do all these interpretations, but uh, the theory or the background you must uh, know. Otherwise, if you uh, want to go to uh, higher studies, uh, in a, uh, particularly in a foreign country, so if you, are, uh, if you will be doing uh, related to this field, uh, these uh, geochemical fields, right? Particularly solid drop geochemistry, or even surface uh, or environmental geochemistry. Even this mixing, this type of mixing calculations are very pre frequently done. So therefore, you must have this uh, background knowledge at least uh, to some extent, right? Uh, then you can uh, easily grab what uh, you have to study under that level. Okay, right. Okay, so this type of uh, curves can be produced, and uh, another uh, equation which has uh, de uh, derived, uh, which has shown for strontium isotopes, the similar equation, similar type of uh, the similar equation actually. Uh, here, instead of a and b, you have real values. Instead of a and b, what you have is uh, real uh, values that you measure, right? So in the mix, uh, strontium isotopic composition. So. Uh, in the, in uh, the component A, these are two components, A and B, okay? Two components, A and B, right? So in the component A, strontium value is denoted here, right? So uh, the mixing ratio, so how much uh, com component A has contributed uh, to uh, the mixture, right? So uh, say 50% uh, of A, then uh, how about the contribution of B? It should be again 50%. So simply uh, you can vary this uh, ra uh, ratio between zero and one, right? Uh, zero means zero, one means 100%. So in between 50% or 25% or whatever it is, you can put in a decimal, right? You can reduce it into a decimal. So if you have X composition, of uh, component A, for example, in a mixture, what would be its uh, component B if uh, they have uh, only A and B? B component will be X, sorry, XB should be equal to what? Hmm? One minus XA, isn't it? One minus XA. Okay, if you take it as a ratio, right, ratio uh, representation. So that is what you have written here, right? The, uh, actually, this is the XB composition. This is the composition of XB, and right? this is equal to XB. Okay, amount of uh, B in the mixture, 
the ratio of uh, B in the mixture because uh, A and B has have means to uh, produce this final mixture. Uh, maybe 20% uh, of A is mixed with B or 30% of 30% of B is mixed with A to the final mixture. So that is what denoted here by this X. Okay, mixing ratio, we call it mixing ratio. And uh, the strontium composition in A, component A, strontium compo uh, composition in component B, and uh, strontium elemental composition in B, and here uh, the strontium elemental component in A, like that, right? These are not isotopes, these are elemental. So elemental composition is also important in these equations, right? So you have to understand that, uh, particularly if you go for isotopic interpretations, not only isotopes, but also their elements are also important because the, the isotopic abundance is, in, uh, is variable, right? So elemental uh, element concentration is in, uh, needed uh, to know how much uh, abundance of 87 is available there. Likewise, right? that is therefore that uh, elemental concentra concentration term is also coming into this equation, right? So again, uh, you have some terms there, the similar things, similar terms, and this equation will represent you uh, a mixing equation, right? This is called a mixing equation for strontium isotopes. You can you can apply this for any mixture uh, for a strontium isotopes, provided that you know the strontium isotopic compositions as well as strontium elemental concentration, strontium concentration of uh, that particular uh, components, right? Not the, not in the mixture, in component, right? Here, you should know the strontium isotopic composition and here also you should know the strontium isotopic composition and elemental composition as well. And then you can uh, predict uh, the compositions in between, right? You can predict uh, the compositions in between using these uh, components or end members. Actually, this end member composition should be known. Uh, these end members might be, because uh, we are talking about the mantle things. So most of the cases, mantle reservoirs themselves uh, contribute uh, for these mixtures. For example, uh, this uh, component A may be depleted mantle, okay? DM, depleted mantle. And uh, component B may be even a crust, crustal source, continental crust, right? So those two, because uh, the mantle pro um, uh, melt produced from DM, uh, depleted mantle, when it goes up, uh, it can uh, have the uh, crustal contamination uh, that we uh, talked a while ago, right? Or assimilation. See, contamination or assimilation, right? In that case, you have two components there. So you, to understand that mixture, uh, you can use one end member as the mantle or the depleted mantle and the other end member as continental crust, right? So obviously your sample should lie in between these two, right? So you uh, these compositions are known because uh, these reservoir compositions are well known by uh, historical studies. Many studies have done and now people have come up to uh, a consensus where uh, we know the strontium composition of the continental crust this much, uh, strontium composition of uh, depleted mantle is this much. Likewise, we have constant values, more or less constant values we have. So using those uh, values, uh, we can apply into this equation. Right? because uh, this may be the depleted mantle and this may be the continental crust. And their compositions are also known, right? So you model, you make a model curve first of all, right? Using those component, uh, sorry, using those end member compositions, right? So once you have an end member compositions, then you can just um, simply apply this, assuming that uh, variable proportions of melting. Maybe you can think 0.1% uh, uh, or 10, uh, 0.1, uh, continental crust are mixing. That means 10% of continental crust has uh, reacted with the uh, up, uh, uh, so this ascending melt like that. So likewise, you can vary this uh, ratio. It's free. You you can vary it uh, from because you know the ratio is uh, in between zero and one. Right? You, you can play any value in between. Right? So likewise, the, the higher values, the many values uh, should, uh, uh, will give you good uh, results.
right? So if you uh, take uh, point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, point 0.4, likewise, you can end up with uh, 10 compositions, right? If you go with point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, point 0.4, point 0.5, like that, for x, uh, you can arbitrarily put that value because uh, you don't know in the nature how, has, how it has happened, right? So you put those compositions and uh, come up uh, with the reference uh, compositional line, right? Because this should give you uh, uh, this should give you a straight line because you see here strontium is there and here denominator also strontium you have. Okay, these are constant values. So therefore, uh, this equation will give you a straight line. Okay, this is equation will give you a uh, straight line most of the cases. But uh, if uh, some other parameters uh, you used uh, for different uh, components, then it uh, will be a very different one, okay? So here, okay, the, uh, the example is here. Uh, you have 208 lead over 204 lead, right? Here you have 206 lead, 206 lead over 204 lead, but the denominator is same, 204. Denominator is 204, numerator is different. So this means, Essentially, you must get a straight line. Okay, you must get a straight line. Otherwise, you should get a parabola. Okay, hyperbola or parabola or whatever, right? Different ones. So here you see, uh, here you have neodymium and here you have strontium. So you can't get any straight line. But there is one occasion where you get a straight line also, but usually it's uh, parabolic. Oh, sorry, uh, hyperbolic. Okay, right. Anyway. Uh, you can uh, you can draw your reference curve first of all using the n-member compositions that you think of, uh, and also you can try with various n-members because you don't know whether this is really from depleted mantle or uh, something else, right? So then you can try with EM also, right? You can try with EM also, and uh, maybe EM if uh, it is plotted here, and uh, if uh, EM two is here, or otherwise you can just take the continental cast also, right? You have the EM here and continental cast. Then you come up with another curve. Or you can have EM2, EM2 and continental cast, right? Or otherwise, EM1 and EM2, likewise. Okay. Then you take your real sample now. You take your real sample and uh, do uh, using ICPMS or whatever, you may uh, get the measurement because all these measurements that we so far used was reference values because those are known compositions, but you now take the unknown, that is your real sample. And uh, better to have uh, multiples of uh, sample analysis, otherwise you can't uh, interpret uh, clearly. Uh, the higher the values are better, the number of iterations, or oh, no, sorry, number of uh, repetitions, sample numbers uh, is uh, very uh, good if you have higher numbers, right? Then you plot those values, for example, in this, case lead isotope values you mentioned and plot right for lead isotopes also similar equation can be there right okay so you uh, put uh, your analysis uh, values uh, here and there i mean uh, it will plot there and uh, you should be able to find out a pattern right probably you might be uh, aligning your uh, natural or the unknown values uh, like this right very clearly like this right so then you will realize that your natural sample values are more or less uh, same as your modeled curve, one of your modeled curve, that is EM1 and EM2 curve, right? So then you know that your particular unknown sample is a product of a mixture between EM1 and EM2, okay? Because they are very closely lying to your modeled curve. So this is actually modeling, geochemical modeling, right? So this uh, type of results you might end up with. And also if uh, you get uh, some uh, some ratio in between these two, right? This, this two line, uh, these two components, EM1 and continental cast, then you realize that these, uh, your samples should be uh, a product of a mixture of EM1 and continental cast like that. Okay, so likewise, uh, you can uh, you can understand uh, the prehistory of uh, your unknown samples. Your sample is a product of this type of two components. You can realize. Okay, so sometimes you might uh, end up with uh, very very strange values, 
where you can't find any correlation, right? You might not be able to find any correlation. Uh, it looks like you have a curve like here, you have a curve like here, you have a curve like here, very, very complicated, right? Actually, this means that this is wrong, right? You can't interpret your data using two components. That is the implication, okay? But in this type of cases, uh, it's very clear that you can, uh, you can use two components to interpret your data, right? So if you have this sort of uh, very uh, variable type of uh, plottings, then you should realize that they have contributed from uh, more than two components, at least three components like, uh, like this, right? So if those are three components, then your unknown values must lie in between this triangle. Okay, your unknowns should plot inside this triangle. Okay, so this is how you understand the mixtures. Do you remember we had the isotope diagram, uh, strontium, rubidium, strontium isotope dial, uh, sorry, uh, strontium versus, uh, no, it was neodymium here. It was neodymium isotope versus strontium. Right, remember? So there in the mantle, how did you have the plot? You have depleted mantle here. Uh, you had EM somewhere here, right? So EM2 somewhere here and EM1 somewhere here, right? Likewise, you had and bulk silicate earth was here. Okay, so what is the implication? And you had a lot of uh, vessels, OIB is like this plotting and uh, some values go like that and some values go like these. Okay, like that you had, right? So this indicates actually all these basalts, oceanic basalts that you have are mixtures of different components, okay? They are mixtures of different components, maybe EM1 and depleted mantle, EM2 and depleted mantle, or uh, continental crust, which is going like that, right? So likewise, uh, those are the mixtures. So this is the uh, basic understanding of the principle uh, between the uh, mix, uh, mixtures that we understand using the isotope ratio. Okay, right. So any question? This is what you have to uh, understand. This is a very basic concept uh, that we uh, uh, that we uh, use in uh, isotope geochemistry. Right, isotope uh, geochemistry. We apply the isotope ratios to understand mixtures, to interpret the mixtures. Right. I will show you some examples. I will show you some examples uh, uh, relevant to these uh, these ones. Uh, just a minute. don't want to complicate your understanding. Therefore, I remove some of uh, the facts that might be complicating to you. Okay, so we'll go to this one. Okay. Right, can you see? Okay. Right, so this is the uh, mixture that we have been talking about. And uh, here, uh, an example is here. So here you, uh, we see uh, mixing hyperbola, okay? So mixing hyperbola means uh, the strontium isotope composition is there in the uh, y-axis here. And strontium just elemental composition is there in the x-axis. So what is the uh, shape, what should be the shape of the curve? it won't be a straight line. It should be a curve, a hyperbola, uh, hyperbolic curve. It should be a hyperbolic curve, right here, see? So it's not in the uh, denominator, right? It's not the reciprocal. It's just B, like A divided by B and versus B. So it's something like that, right? A divided by B and uh, here just B, 
right? This isotope is there, but it doesn't matter because this is the same element, right? Although it's an isotope, uh, <clears throat> it's an isotope. Uh, you have uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, plot like this as a hyperbole, hyperbole, hyperbolic curve, right? So you have the uh, curve for A and B components. Two components are there, right here, one and the other one. So here, these values indicate your known values. That means like uh, depleted mantle, continental crust, like those are known uh, values. And these isotopic and concentration values in the mixtures uh, also were determined using the mixing ratios, uh, that is R, right? So mixing, mixing ratio means, uh, just a minute. Uh, mixing ratio means uh, the values that we applied 0 0.1, 0 0.2, that means 1%, 2%, 3%, like that, right? So this is how you can get this zero. Zero means just entirely only one component, B, component B, right? Then uh, you have 0.2% uh, here, 0.2% of A here, okay? 0.2% of A mixed with uh, B. Then 0.4% of A mixed with B, likewise, right? Here, around here, 0.5%. That means 50% of A, 50% of B, something like that. Right, when you go down up there, it is uh, one here. One means uh, it's entirely A, right? Zero percent of B, right? No B. Here, if on in other words, if you take eighty percent of A plus twenty percent of B, something like that. Okay. So if you want to make this graph uh, more uh, easy for your interpretations, what you do is instead of strontium, you just take the reciprocal of strontium. Okay, one over is uh, the strontium ppm, that value, you make it uh, one over uh, ratio. That is the reciprocal. Then what you end up is, you will, uh, you will uh, come up with a straight line. Okay, if you have a straight line, that is much easier for your interpretations because later on what you do is, you take your unknown sample and you uh, plot them your values, so many, uh, I mean, many samples you have to measure because you, if you want to get the accuracy, you have to have a uh, higher number of samples. Otherwise uh, you might look like uh, uh, two samples are aligning with this equation or something, e this uh, line uh, align with li this line also. But later on you realize that some samples are giving values here also. So then uh, this equation, this uh, line might not be reasonable. Then you have to shift your line like this. Right, so something like that. So anyway, uh, uh, you can uh, plot your uh, unknown values here, and then you can realize uh, actually uh, how much percentage uh, A and B have contributed to your samples. Okay, if they are deviating very much away from your mixing curve, the straight line, then you must realize that this cannot be explained by A and B there must be another component that is C, right? That means component uh, C. So then you have your unknown samples plotting in between this triangle, okay? So then you should uh, realize that this is not a simple mixing and this must have, this particular rock has undergone at least two stages of uh, changes. That means three, at least three components must be there. Something like that, okay? This is the application. And uh, here are some examples uh, taken from the literature. Uh, one hyperbolic curve is here. Strontium isotropic composition is here. I think here also the elemental strontium maybe. I'm not sure it's a little bit uh, covered. Or even uh, it can be a, uh, some other uh, value, trace element value also. That is also possible. See here, you have lanthanum cerium ratio here, right? But here you have strontium isotope value. It doesn't matter. You can have uh, equations in between, like uh, this is the equation for strontium mixture, right? But this can be other uh, elements as well, right? These uh, equations can be formed uh, for that, right? So this Langmuir uh, paper describes how these equations were for formulated, right? It can be applicable for trace elements as well as isotopes. It doesn't matter, right? So people extensively use uh, uh, these equations and uh, they assume some uh, 
some n members right some n members and then they model a curve and then uh, you plot, plot the unknowns when you plot the unknowns you will see uh, their distribution very close to this curve uh, these many samples are plotting very close to this curve like this but you have some uh, very uh, some uh, some uh, deviations as well right you can take this also and also these two also you can take uh, close to your uh, curve at different places that means the different uh, percentages of contributions from components a and b right but if you have this type of abnormal values definitely uh, either they are erroneous or otherwise they have affected by another uh, component right which is uh, which might not be common uh, effect to the entire set of samples right this may be a very exceptional case here you see most of the samples are very closely plotting to the curve very nicely plotting right so it clearly uh, uh, indicates that your sample is a uh, mixture between this type of two n members right these are some uh, values and here also you can see uh, you have the strontium uh, at the uh, denominator and here also uh, you have the strontium as the denominator but uh, the numerator is a different one this is cerium right uh, but still uh, you can have a straight line and very beautifully your samples are plotted the unknown samples are plotted so that indicates these samples uh, exhibit uh, that they have affected by two components uh, like uh, one is here and the other one is here in this uh, side so you can calibrate this curve during your model cal uh, calibration right uh, percentage values right even this curve can be calibrated then you will understand this particular sample has affected this much of uh, this component mostly 50 percent of a 50 percent of b like but uh, this one has highly affect i mean a very least contribution from this particular component it's away from this component but high contribution from this side Likewise, you can do the interpretations. And uh, another one is here. So you see different rock types, alkali basalts and tholites. So different samples. So you have different samples. They have undergone same type of uh, interaction. That means uh, all these uh, uh, tectonic setting has uh, affected similarly. All the samples show similar distribution, right? Similar way of distribution, okay? right uh, that means you you can have one curve to interpret uh, multiple rock types otherwise uh, if they have suffered different uh, uh, different uh, interactions then you must be ha having another curve i mean you must uh, should you should be able to uh, uh, locate them with another curve if you had samples deviating like this but uh, here you don't have deviations for example if you had deviations like this Right, some samples you can never explain these ones using this uh, uh, this uh, line. What you can do is you can create a, uh, another model curve and explain the experiment. So that means your samples have suffered two stages of uh, changes, two stages of uh, interactions. We call them interactions, right? Melting events and mixing events. So those are called interactions, right? Again, here uh, one over k. And here also, uh, K is a reciprocal, right? So therefore, you have a straight line. Similarly, another example is here. Uh, so these interpretations are very interesting. Uh, you have uh, here. So okay, this is an ideal example to show you deviations, right? So some of the samples uh, which are shown here are plotting very, very precisely on the curve itself right here also you see but this set of sample and this set of samples are deviating they are they are having very uh, other distribution right they are having a different distribution so you may need another curve to interpret their uh, their behavior okay so that means this set of samples are very different from uh, the other two sets of samples so that is the implication so this a uh, lot of uh, in, a lot of other details are required, uh, like uh, petrographic information and all are required to understand 
their uh, geochemical evolution anyway. Okay, this is a very brief interpretation. So here I uh, I show you the recent uh, some of the recent values for, uh, published in Journal of Geology. Uh, this is my work. Uh, it's a 2021 paper. Uh, here, <clears throat> when we plotted neodymium isotopes versus strontium isotopes, two uh, isotope ratios plotted, uh, I, I, I could observe two very clear variations, right? One variation is here. I termed it as trend two, the other one as trend one, right? So two very uh, clear two variations uh, were observed in Vijayan complex samples, right? Some of the samples from the Vijayan complex, okay? Uh, this is an isotope uh, study. And uh, when I modeled, uh, uh, I could find uh, some contribution from uh, ancient lower continental crust as one component. And here, I think uh, the depleted mantle, right? Uh, oh, no, sorry, OIB, oceanic island basalt. As a uh, as a, another component, and the other one is juvenile uh, lower continental crust. The juvenile uh, you you will uh, you are not familiar with these terms. Maybe uh, this is uh, like young young crust. This is old crust, right? Young crust and old crust have shown uh, interactions with the Vijayan complex samples in two ways, right? These calibration uh, curve values, the ratios are shown. And around the uh, curve, you see these uh, samples are plotted, right? So that indicates uh, one mixing pattern is uh, shown here and the other mixing pattern is shown by this curve, right? Two mixing, at least two mixing uh, patterns are observed there. And also another uh, set of sample, uh, we have a very different set, uh, into a very different uh, trend, uh, which is uh, trend three here like this you, you see these uh, numbers are different these isotope numbers are different so that means they have a, a separate set of samples isotope samples okay so one set and the other trend like this right so here felsic ancient uh, oh sorry arcane crust and here mafic uh, arcane crust right they have contributed that means some melting from these uh, felsic archaean crust or mafic archaean crust has affected our vision complex samples they show uh, very different isotopic trends so these are the quantitative estimations of uh, these isotopic uh, ratios and uh, we can clearly interpret they uh, they uh, form they form uh, different trends okay so that means at least four uh, trends were observed for the first time in the Vijayan complex. Uh, I, will, I will send you this uh, Journal of Geology paper uh, for you, uh, you to read, uh, but uh, you might not be able to understand all the uh, uh, parts, but uh, uh, since now you have uh, the background, you may be able to uh, digest it to some extent, right? So uh, of course we have to uh, know uh, the uh, end member compositions, right? End members, uh, these end members, for example, lower continental crust. So we have to take, I, I took those values from this reference, right? So there are such references, OIB values, ocean island basalt values, uh, mid ocean ridge basalts like that, right? Uh, here, I think uh, the mob and, uh, uh, maybe Karkin plus two component here OIB, right? Here MOB like that. So likewise, uh, different uh, uh, estimations are there. So these estimations are available as constants. Like I mean, uh, accepted values. So we can use those values and do model curves and uh, fit your unknown samples uh, with those uh, curves, and then. Uh, you can interpret uh, whether they are really fitting, but uh, the most difficult task is to find out the corresponding uh, mixing end member. That is very, very difficult, right? Because you have unknown sample. You don't know whether it is a product of lower continental crust or upper continental crust or EM or DM or whatever it is. So you have to take hundreds of samples. You have to consider hundreds of samples and compare the isotopic values and take uh, closely matching ones first. Then you... Uh, go with the uh, mixing equation and try to uh, construct this uh, mixing curve. If the mixing curve also comes closer to your samples, then uh, you can decide that it fits, right? Otherwise, when you calculate the mixing curve, 
you might end up with some value like this, some curve like this, right? But your samples are here, right? That means they are not fitting, right? So likewise, you have to uh, choose the uh, very, very correct uh, in member composition. Otherwise, uh, it will end up with the uh, very, uh, very wrong uh, interpretation. Okay, right. So this is what I have to uh, uh, cover you under uh, this last lecture. So if you have any questions, so you just uh, let me know whether did you understand uh, this concept, uh, this uh, content. This is the application of isotopic ratios in different uh, interpretations, right? Petrogenetic interpretation. So we have to discuss about the origin of the Vigian complex in this uh, particular example. Okay, did you understand? Did you understand this uh, this part? Any questions uh, up to this? Uh, because with this, I have to finish uh, my lecture series. And uh, yeah, what about uh, uh, interlal? Did you understand? Yes. Yeah, what about others? Uh, because this is not, uh, I mean, uh, modeling is not the easy part, but uh, uh, we have to do the proper identification of components and all. Prabodha, how about uh, uh, you understood? Yes, sir. Okay. So I hope uh, everyone understood this uh, concepts as well. So we will uh, finish the isotope uh, lecture series uh, from here, my part. And I think Ella Kisa has also finished. And Peter Wilson may be doing a few more uh, within this uh, week, I guess. Uh, so you have to get ready for your examinations from 15th onwards, OK? I think on 15th itself, uh, isotope geology is there. So I will send you the timetable uh, later on, uh, maybe today, uh, this uh, tonight. Uh, so uh, we will uh, stop here then. Okay, good night. Thanks.